If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Esther chapter 9. Esther chapter 9. This is the final message in the book of Esther. Uh, we have been journeying through this for some time. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I hope it's been rich for you and that we have grasped some things about the Spirit-filled life. Remember that the story of Esther is basically about the fact that King Ahasuerus was in charge of 127 provinces. And as he was in charge, he married a woman named Esther who became his queen. In the midst of that, he made a very wrong decision, poor decision, in the fact that he gave control over to a man named Haman. He gave him his signet ring. And Haman was an evil man. Because he was an evil man, he was opposed to the good man Mordecai and was despised Mordecai because Mordecai, being a Jew, would not bow down to him at all. So he set forth a plan that he would have Mordecai killed, but instead of just killing Mordecai, he set forth a plan to kill all of Mordecai's people called the Jews, the people of God. And while they would be killed, that would mean Mordecai would be killed as well. And the king allowed him to set forth this edict and this plan to kill the Jews. When Mordecai heard about the plan, he went into a state of grieving, put on sackcloth, ashes, and was grieving because of the direction of the nation. His daughter Esther, the queen, when she found out about him grieving, she sends out clothes to him and says, Don't grieve anymore. Don't want you to grieve. I want you to feel better. And he says, I cannot stop grieving. The only thing that will happen that will help me is there must be a change in the decision in the kingdom. And you, as queen, need to go in and talk to the king. She says, you don't understand, I can't go in. If I go in without the king summoning me, I will be put to death immediately. He says, you're going to have to take the chance because God gave you this position probably to save our people. So she says, pray for me. They fasted and prayed for three days and she goes in to the presence of the king. Instead of killing her, he holds out the golden scepter which says, I give to you grace and favor. And he said, what would you have me do for you? up to half of the kingdom. She said, first I want you to come to a banquet, you and Haman. And so he and Haman went to the first banquet and once again he said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, well, I want you to come to a second banquet tomorrow. So they were coming and planning to be in that second banquet. You remember that night, Haman was excited about what had happened, but he also could not stand Mordecai. And he said, I just can't know what to do. And his wife and friends said, what you need to do? is to build a gallows here at the house and in the morning go and tell the king and ask the king who loves you so much if you could have Mordecai killed in the morning. And that same night, though, you remember what happened. In the king's palace, he could not sleep. He gets up, he reads through the chronicles of the king, and when he reads through those chronicles, he finds that there was a good man named Mordecai who actually saved his life. And he asked the question, what good thing has been done for this man? And they said, nothing. They said, well, he said, well, who is in the court of the king that might honor this man? And about that time, Haman walks in. You remember that? And Haman walks in, and the king says, what should be done to the man that the king wants to honor? And Haman gives this whole thing. Put a royal robe on him, and crown on the horse, and put him, and let him ride the royal steed, and somebody lead him through the square, and pronounce how great he is, thinking it's going to be him. Whenever the king surprises him and says, well, take Mordecai, and do that for him. Haman knows that he is in trouble. Before he can grieve very long, though, they summon him to the banquet, that second banquet that Esther gives. And at that point, when the king says, what is your request? She says, there is a wicked and evil man in our kingdom, and his name is Haman. Haman has set forth to kill me and my people. The king becomes very angry at himself primarily for letting an evil man rule and reign. Goes out in the garden, but when he comes back in, he finds out that Haman is begging for his life. And somebody says, what do we do with Haman? And he says, they said, the gallows have been prepared by Haman for Mordecai. And he says, go and hang Haman on those gallows. And he put Haman to death. And that was an important thing. He must die. The evil man had to die. Then he does something very important as well. He takes the signet ring that he took off Haman's hand and he puts it on the finger of Mordecai the good man. And now the good man is in charge. That's important, that the good man be in charge. He sets in motion a plan whereby the Jews would have an opportunity to save themselves, would have an opportunity to defend themselves rather than being destroyed. And he sets forth that plan and issues that edict. It's such a good plan 
that the nation rejoices, the kingdom is filled with joy, and the king elevates Mordecai, putting a robe on his back and putting a crown on his head. He elevates him into this place of prominence. The good man is in charge, and the nation has been blessed. We know that's a picture of our spiritual lives. We, our bodies, are that kingdom where everything is lived out. The king who makes the decision in the kingdom, that's our soul, our mind, emotion, and will, where we make the decisions of what we're going to do with our bodies and our lives. And Esther being that queen, that's our human spirit that's wed together with our soul. We have an evil man who tries to work in us to do the wrong thing. That's the flesh. And then we have a good man, and that's the Holy Spirit who wants to sit on the throne and who needs to run our lives. The problem is that many of us are like King Ahasuerus. We've given the ring to the wrong person. We've allowed the old flesh to rule and reign in our life, to control our lives, to dictate for us what we will do, and that's a bad thing for our lives, just as it was a bad thing for the kingdom. What must happen in our lives is what had to happen with Haman. He had to be put to death on the gallows. Well, what has to happen to our flesh is our flesh must be put to death on the cross of Christ. We must die to our flesh, die to that old sinful nature. And then we have to take that ring that the old flesh had been having and Haman had, and we've got to put it on the right man's hand. In the case of the kingdom, it was Mordecai. In our case, it's the Holy Spirit of God. We need to let Him be in charge of our life. It means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when He comes in and He begins to lead our lives, listen to what happens. He changes everything. He reverses those things and, and He makes our lives good instead of being evil like the old flesh wants it to be. And He'll engineer everything and move heaven and earth if He has to to enable us to live a life of abundance and victory. It's the best thing a child of God ever decides to do. We must do that. And when we realize how wonderful He is, we, like the king, elevated Mordecai, we need to elevate the Holy Spirit. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. We need to let Him rule and reign over our hearts and our lives. Well, to close out this book, I want to share with you four closing points to Esther. Four very important things that you need to understand to finish out this story, to finish out this study, and to finish out what we would understand from this book about the Spirit-filled life. The first thing I want you to see is found in chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. Read with me there. It says, Then Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to celebrate the 14th day of the ninth month of Adar and the 15th day of the same month annually. Underline this now. Because on those days the Jews rid themselves of their enemies and it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. Then look down at verse 28. So these days are to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, province every city. And these days of Purim were not to fall, to fail from among the Jews, or their memory fade from their descendants. I want you to understand today that there is a day to remember. That's the first point. There is a day to remember. Whenever they set in motion, Mordecai set in motion and wrote the edicts that allowed the Jews to defend themselves and turned what was going to be a tragedy and a mass killing of all the Jews turn that from a mass killing to victory for the Jews. When that happened, it was a glorious day, a wonderful day. And in the Jewish calendar, it's called the Feast of Purim. They wrote that in there and said, this is a day to be remembered. It is a day when sorrow is turned to joy, when mourning has turned into a holiday. It is a day to be remembered when the right man who's in charge corrects and enables victory to come where there was certain defeat. It was a day to be remembered. 
Now, I want you to understand something. In our spiritual lives and in our spiritual journey, whenever we decide and when we understand the importance of living the Spirit-filled life, the importance of allowing the Holy Spirit to sit on the throne, to give Him the signet ring of authority over our lives, and to let Him begin to take charge of us, I want to tell you something. That is a day to be remembered. That is a day to be remembered. Just as our salvation day should be a time of celebration when we're born again, the day when we learn to live and walk in the Spirit should be a day to remember and a day of celebration. See, in my life, I told you that at seven years of age, I gave my heart to Christ. I gave my heart to Him and He saved me. And my eternal destiny was settled at that point in time. I didn't have to worry about hell anymore. I was going to heaven. And I remember that day. Oh, I'm not saying that you actually remember the date. Some of you may know that date. But I, what I'm saying is you remember the experience. You remember the experience of when you gave your heart and your life to Christ. If you don't remember that experience, you need to go back and check that out. Because it's not something that's by osmosis happens to you. It's the fact that you actually make a decision that you want Jesus to be in your heart and life. And whether you were 7, 17, or 70, that day you should remember. That's a day to remember. But wait a minute. I also shared with you that when I was 18 years old, a college student, that someone shared with me about the Holy Spirit. Now, I had heard about the Holy Spirit. I'm sure I had great pastors who taught me, but somehow I just didn't hear it. Somehow I didn't understand it. But at the age of 18, I come to realize who the Holy Spirit was and what He wanted to do in my life, and I surrendered for the first time that I knew of. I surrendered the throne room and the signet ring to the Holy Spirit, and it radically changed my life. And that became a day of celebration. See, when I tell my testimony, I tell that when I got saved at the age of seven and gave my heart to Christ, but I also tell them that at the age of 18, when I was a college student, I learned how to let the Holy Spirit live in my life and rule my life, and it radically changed me. It is a day of celebration. It is a day to remember. Now, let me give you a biblical context of that. If you remember in the disciples and when they had a relationship with Christ, it's not always really clear about when they came to know Jesus and when they were believers. We know they followed Him. But a lot of times we don't know exactly when was it that they became children of God or they were saved. Except for one. There was one that we pretty well know whenever he came to know Christ or that he knew Christ before that time, and that was Peter. You remember Peter at Caesarea Philippi? You remember when Jesus said, but, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That great confession. It was such a great confession, it almost caught Jesus off, off guard. He said, Wow, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. My Father in heaven revealed this to you that you would understand that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah, that I am the Anointed One. And Jesus made, uh, Peter made that confession of Jesus, and we pretty well know based on that confession that he was a believer. He was saved. And when Jesus died on that cross and he paid the price for sin, that washed away Peter's, blood, Peter's sin by his blood because he believed in Jesus. He was saved. But hold on a second. Just because Peter was saved at that point in time, did that mean that he lived a victorious Christian life? <laughs> did that mean that he walked in the power and the boldness of God? Did that mean he had all the joy and the fullness of God in him? No, not necessarily. Because you remember what happened at the cross? You remember what happened at the cross? Peter had bragged and said, I will not deny you. These others may deny you, but I will not deny you. But then Jesus said, oh, yes, you will. And just as Jesus foretold, he denied him three times before the cock crowed. And what did Peter do? He went away grieving. He went away brokenhearted. He went away a failure. Didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. He was such a failure that he didn't think even the resurrected Jesus, he was hesitant about seeing him because he was so ashamed. 
That's why Jesus says to the angel, make sure you tell Peter to come. Make sure you tell Peter to come. Because Peter had been a wretched failure, even though a child of God. But hold on a second. Then comes Acts 2. You know what happens in Acts 2, don't you? That's the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon the lives of those believers and comes upon the heart and life of Peter. And in Acts 2 and 3 and all through the book of Acts, you find him now standing boldly and proclaiming to those same Jews that he was fearful of, he he proclaims boldly that this is the Christ, the Son of God, and you must come to faith in him. How such a change? How is he bold? How does he now have the power of God in his life? Because what happened at Pentecost, the feeling of the Spirit of God. Now that will never happen like that again. There'll never be another Pentecost. But do you know what the Bible records? It records the salvation of Peter and it records the time Peter was filled with the Spirit. It records the fact that when he was filled with the Spirit, he was empowered and he was distinctly different in how he walked in this world. Salvation settles our eternal destiny, but the feeling of the Spirit determines how we live in this world, how we live in this life and what we do. And it records that Peter was saved, but Peter was filled. Hold on a second. What about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, wasn't he? I mean, he saw the bright light. He went blind. He heard Jesus speak to him, and he gave his heart to Jesus. But wait a minute. In Romans chapter 7, which we have used in this study, in Romans chapter 7, the redeemed Paul says this, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of sin and death? For I do not understand. The things that I want to do, I do not do. And the things that I do not want to do are the very things that I am doing. He, even though saved, redeemed, and has been washed in the blood on the Damascus road, He still is struggling about having victory until you come to Romans 8. In Romans 8, he says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the rest of Romans 8 talks about learning how to live the Spirit-filled life. Instead of walking in the power of the flesh, I walk in the power of the Spirit. So Paul, in recorded in Acts, as well as in Romans, gives two things. I was saved but I learned how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I learned to let my life be empowered by the Spirit of God. Now let me tell you something. I hope right now that you can say in your heart and your life, I'm saved. I know that experience. I know when God talked to me. I know when I asked Jesus in my heart, prayed that prayer, confessed my sin, and He forgave me. I know that I'm a child of God. Well, let me ask you something. Can you tell me, not the date, not necessarily the time, but can you tell me that experience in your life when you understood, when you realized that the Holy Spirit was in your heart and in your life and that He was supposed to be in charge? Can you tell me that time in your heart and your life when you realized the Holy Spirit wasn't just there as baggage, but He was there as Lord? And He was there to take charge of your life and He was everything you were going to need? And that you prayed and you said, God, I want you to kill my flesh I want to get off the throne and I want the Spirit of God to take control of my life. I want Him to be Lord over my life. I want to be filled with His presence and I want to be directed and empowered. Can you tell me about that day when it happened to you? Because I promise you, when that happens to you, you will never, ever forget it. Now we will do that often. We will do that often, as we'll talk about in a minute. But I'm telling you, the first time when I realized that and I understood that, I got the power of God in my life. And I realized what a wonderful, blessed thing it was that the Holy Spirit of God had come to reside in me, not just reside in me, but the Lord over my life. It was a day to remember. What did Mordecai say? Mordecai said, don't forget this day. Don't forget this day. When the good man has been in charge and the victory came out of a time of mourning, do not forget this day. I encourage you, do not forget that day that you experienced the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the filling of the Holy Spirit is not something you get from the outside. You've got all of Him that you'll ever get from him, of Him when you got saved. 
All that means when you're filled is that you let Him have all of you. <laughs> you let Him have all of you. And you let Him be in charge over your life. Second thing I want you to see from this passage, it's found in chapter 8, verse 17. I want you to see that there's a life to be desired. A life to be desired. Listen to what this passage says. And in each and every province, and in each and every city, wherever the king's commandments and his decree arrived, there was, underline this, there was gladness and joy for the Jew, and a feast and a holiday. Listen to this now. And many among the peoples of the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen on them. You hear that something special took place right there. Something special took place in the fact that when the Jews experienced a victory out of defeat and their hearts were filled with joy and with gladness, it says the people, the peoples in the land, the people of the land, they weren't Jews. They would be pagan. They didn't know, they didn't know God. They didn't know Jehovah. They were the pagans of the land who worshiped false gods. But when they saw what had happened with the Jews, and they saw them celebrating and rejoicing and enjoying a feast and a holiday when they should have all been put to death, and they realized that the hand of their God had worked to save them, preserve them, and bless them, when they watched what had happened to those people of God, you know what they said? We want to become Jews. Now, that wasn't, they couldn't be the Jew by race, but it was Jew by choice. In other words, they were saying, we want to begin to serve your God. We want to begin to worship your God. We want to begin to follow your God. We want to be the kind of people that you are. We want the same God who works for you to work for us. And we want a God who can change mourning into joy and that you have gladness and joy in your heart. We want that kind of God. We want that kind of God. Of God. Can I say something to you? I don't think people are any different today than they were back then. Do you, you know what I think that people want to see and are looking for in our world, in our land today? I think they're actually looking for a people who will allow their God to do such a work in their life that God changes mourning into joy. And God causes the people of God to have gladness and rejoice. To have such a gladness and rejoicing spirit that other people say, hey, what's different about you? What do you have that I don't have? How can you have such joy and gladness? How can you have that? And you know what we get to say? Because of Jesus... Because we have a relationship with a living God. Because our God cares for us and He died on the cross for us and He sent His Spirit to live within us and He works in the midst of us and He'll move heaven and earth to bless us. That's the God we serve. And we can have joy in our heart, gladness in our spirit, and we're excited about having a relationship with a living God. I think if that were to begin to happen, I think other people might want to have a relationship with that same God. What do you think? I think they might want to have a relationship with a God who works like that, with a God who cares like that. And we have the opportunity and the privilege of letting other people know by the life that we live, we should be living such a life, experiencing so much of the fullness of the Spirit of God that the people of the land want what we have. Now I'm telling you what, that's the easiest witnessing opportunity you'll ever have in your life. When you don't have to worry about how do I start this conversation, you don't have to worry about diagnostic questions, all you have to do is answer that question when they say, hey, what's different about you? What do you have that I don't have? Well, that's pretty easy, right? I hope we'd say the right thing. The right thing is I got Jesus. I got Jesus, and that's all I can say, that Jesus changes my life. See, whenever the victory came, rather than defeat, when the hand of God worked and those people began to rejoice and have festivity, 
because they were living in victory instead of defeat, other people in the land wanted to be like them. Well, may God help us to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that other people would want to be like us. That other people would want to have a relationship with God like we have. It is a life to be desired. A third thing is this. There's a warning to be heeded. There's a warning to be heeded. It's found here in chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. It's kind of an, an unusual verse, a couple of verses. Matter of fact, it makes some people feel a little peculiar. But listen to what happens. In 9, 13, and 14. Here it is. Then said Esther, If it pleases the king, let tomorrow also be granted to the Jews who are in Susa to do according to the edict of today. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded it should be done so. And an edict was issued in Susa, and Haman's ten sons were hanged on the gallows. Wow! That bothers some people. They say, man, that sounds ruthless. I can't believe Esther would ask for Haman's ten sons to be hung on the gallows just like Haman was hung on the gallows. Well, that's because you don't understand the spiritual significance of it. See, here's the spiritual significance of it. You've got to remember who Haman was. Haman was an Agagite, which means he came from the lineage of King Agag, who was an Amalekite. I don't know if you remember about the Amalekites, but God said that there would be perpetual enmity between God and the Amalekites. The Amalekites would always, in all of their generations, would be working to try to hinder and destroy the work and the plan of God. That all Amalekites would be against the plan of God. And King Agag was one of those kings. So here's Haman. Why is it that Haman works in cooperation with Satan to try to destroy the Jews? Because Satan doesn't want anybody to rise up out of the lineage of the Jews to hold the scepter and to put him in defeat. So he wants to destroy the Jews in every generation. So here's Haman, who's an Agagite, who says, I'll cooperate with you, and I'll set forth a plan to kill all the Jews. Why? Because in his very nature, there was the cooperation with the enemy to try to hinder the plan of God. And that passed down to his sons as well. See, Esther knew this, that if those sons were allowed to live because they were Amalekites and Agagites, they, when they got to a point and had an opportunity, they would try to stand against the plan of God and they would try to destroy the Jews. And what needed to happen to them is that they needed to be put to death so we do not have to deal with them in the future. They must be put to death for they are an enemy of the plan of God. And they were. Put to death. What does that say about you and me? Let me okay, listen now. If you miss anything, don't miss this. Remember, old Haman's the flesh, right? Our flesh. And what do we have to do with our flesh? We have to put it to death, don't we? We have to allow it to be crucified on the cross of Christ. It must be put to death. And I hope that you learned how to put your flesh to death. Let Jesus nail it to the cross. Let it be paid for. Let your flesh be put to death. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Our old flesh has a lot of sons. Our old flesh has a posterity that continues on. What do I mean by that? I can put to death the flesh today, but in the morning when I get up, do you know what? I'm looking and there's one of his sons. There's one of his sons who's just as mean and evil as he is, and that son has to be put to death. And when I get up the next day, you know what? I have to put another son to death. I have to perpetually be dealing with my flesh. When it is crucified, somehow, some way, it shows up again. Right? To be honest with you, that's not really the way it is. I can crucify him in the morning, and by lunchtime, I'm having to deal with his son. Not the next day, really, if you don't know the truth. And matter of fact, to be more honest than that, is I can put him to death at 5 in the morning, and by 9 o'clock, he's shown up again. I've killed a lot of sons of Haman. <laughs> I've killed a lot of sons of the flesh. They just keep coming back. It tells you this, that whenever you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you're letting the Holy Spirit be in charge of your life, 
You're going to have to perpetually be dying to your flesh and you're going to have to continuously be asking for the Holy Spirit to be in charge of your life. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, be not, be, be not drunk with wine, but be ye continuously filled. Continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. That's something you have to always do. Because Haman has a lot of sons. And they're just like him. And your flesh has a lot of sons. And they're just like the old flesh. They have to be put to death. Don't make a deal with them. Don't try to give them some amnesty. Don't make any. Don't, they have to be put to death. If not, they'll be just like Haman. Just like the flesh. Final thing. I want you to see a truth to rejoice over. This is worth you coming today. It's found in chapter 10, verse 3. And we'll be finished. It says this, For Mordecai the Jew was second only to the king of Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews in favor of the multitude of the kinsmen. Now listen to what it says. He was one who sought the good of his people, and one who spoke for the welfare of his whole nation. Two things it says Mordecai did. This was his life. One, he sought good for his people. And the second thing, he spoke for the welfare of the nation. Those two things. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit does those same two things for us. The first thing the Holy Spirit does, He seeks in our lives to work and to seek to do good for each and every one of us. Just like it says, Mordecai sought good for his people. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Holy Spirit seeks good for you and me. And you need to understand that. The Holy Spirit is always seeking good for you and me. The old devil's going to come along and try to whisper in your ear and make you think that's not true. The old devil's going to try to deceive you and make you think that's not, not the reality. But here's the reality. The Holy Spirit of God is always seeking good for you and me. He directs our path to accomplish God's will and to enable us to experience the abundant life which Jesus promised to us. He produces within us the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He gives all of those things. In other words, the Holy Spirit is here to do good in you. To lead you and me to abundant life. What a blessing. But that's not all He does. Look at the second part. He's one who seeks for our welfare and speaks for our welfare. A second thing the Holy Spirit does for us is to speak for our welfare. And do you know where He does that? He does that through intercession before God. You know what it says in Romans 8, 26, 27? The Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because, listen, He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Of God. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is constantly doing for you and me? He's interceding for us. He's constantly before the throne of God, speaking for our welfare. He's constantly bringing our name up before God Almighty, speaking on our behalf. When we don't even realize it, He's speaking on our behalf. Wow! Not only that, whenever we pray, he helps us to pray according to the will of God. In other words, sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes we're not praying. But you know what the Holy Spirit's doing? He's still interceding. He's still praying. You know what He does for us whenever we pray and don't know how to pray? We'll pray and we, we're saying, God, we're trying to pray. We think this is what you want, this your will. You know what the Holy Spirit will say sometimes? God, don't answer that. <laughs> That's not your will. That's not what you want for them, but they're seeking you, so this is what I pray. I pray according to your will. Boy, I'm excited about that. When I don't know how to pray, if I pray, the Holy Spirit makes it right. He prays according to the will of God and brings to pass what God really wants, because I don't know He does what I need. But He's ever speaking before God on my behalf. On my behalf. Let me tell you something. If there's a Holy Spirit, and there is, who loves me enough 
that he abides within me, patiently abides within me, seeks to fill me by directing and controlling me, and his desire for me is always good to accomplish God's will and the fullness of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit be in me, and he's standing before the Father, making intercession for me according to the will of God. I want that one to be in charge of my life. I want that person to have free reign in my life. I do not want the flesh to have one moment to be in charge. I want him to be in charge. A day to be remembered? Yes. When we learn and we surrender control of our lives over to the Holy Spirit. A life to be desired? May we be so filled with the Holy Spirit that other people want to have a relationship with God like we have. A warning to be heeded? Yes. The old flesh keeps coming back. It has to be crucified. And as it's crucified, we let the Holy Spirit sit on the throne. And wow, a truth to be cherished, a truth to rejoice over, is that this good man, the Holy Spirit, just like Mordecai, he seeks the good for each and every one of us, and he constantly speaks for our welfare on our behalf before God the Father. I don't know about you, but if there's one thing the book of Esther convinces me of, is I want the good man, the Holy Spirit, to be in charge. I want the Holy Spirit to be in charge. Now today, I hope every one of you can say, Brother Mac, I know that I have Jesus in my heart. I know that I'm a child of God. I know I'm headed for heaven. If you can't say that, you need to come forward and we need to pray with you and talk to you. This morning, a man came forward and gave his heart to Christ. If you have not given your heart to Jesus and you do not know for certain that you're going to heaven, you need to settle that issue today. You need to give your heart to Jesus. But if you're sitting here and you're confident, you know you're a child of God. Could I ask you this? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Right now where you sit, are you letting Him sit on the throne room? He's the one who calls the shots in your life. He's the one who gives direction to your heart. He is Lord over your life. If not, will you do that today? Will you do that today? I'm here to tell you, it will radically change you. It will radically change you when you learn to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It'll be a day to remember, a life that is changed. Will you do that today? That's my prayer. That's my hope. Maybe you're here and you've been praying about a church home and God's spoken to you. He wants to be a part of the Parker family. We'd love for you to come and join our fellowship. We had three people join this morning. Our fellowship by transfer of a letter. You come. You join our fellowship. Maybe you've made accepted Christ and have not been baptized. You need to come for baptism. You come. we will be happy to baptize you, to help you with that, for you to be obedient with Christ, for Christ and what He tells you to do regarding baptism. The invitation time is for us to do what Jesus wants us to do. And I, my prayer, my hope, is that every one of us will surrender. I'm here to pray with you, to help you. The altar is open for you to come and pray. Don't let this go by. Don't wait till another day. Don't wait till another chapter in Esther, for there is none. Now's the time to apply what we've been talking about, to be spirit-filled. 